Hey, it's Matt Pinfield. It's KLOS New and Approved. I'm here with an old friend of mine who I'm so excited to have on the show, and that's Mike Ness from Social Distortion. Mike, it's so great to see you. Good to see you, man. You know, we go back a long way now, and it's... Uh, long. You know? I was trying to remember how long. I, I want to say... Were you maybe still in college? Yeah, it was really... Like college radio. Yeah, it was in college radio. But Prison was, Bound? Or? Yeah, it, when I was back in Jersey, you know yeah. what I mean? And you guys would play yeah. City Gardens or places like that. And, yeah. You know, and I, but wow. I was a big... F- yeah. You remember those shows? Of, well, yeah, right? of course. Yeah, it was incredible. So that's when uh, we finally uh, connected back then and became friends. And then through all those other years, it like... Yeah. You know... Various MTV. stages of your... Yeah. Of our careers, yeah. Which is great. So I'm glad we've had that friendship all these years. And uh, first of all, I just want to say it's great to see you here. You know, all of us were extremely concerned, all, all your friends, all your fans, um, when we, you were diagnosed with, with tonsil cancer. Mm-hmm. And um, and you've been through some, you know, incredible group of treatments. And I, I, I can only imagine how brutal that is. I mean, so talk to me about coming yeah, out the other I mean, side. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, first of all, obviously it wasn't in the plan. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so the shock is, you know, a lot just to take in. And, and uh, but yeah, the surgery, you know, I mean, you can hear it in my voice. It's still weak, you know, just talking. I, I have a lot of work to do before April, you know, for a tour of rehab. But it's only been a month since the treatment's ended. And uh, so it, you know, uh, but uh, yeah, you know, uh, it's been hell, you yeah. know, because it's uh, it's um, head and neck is a little bit different than other types of cancers, and they have to go in and disrupt major structures that you've been living with your whole life. You know, I had to learn how to swallow all over again, and you know, uh, and speech is just slowly getting stronger and then eventually singing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad, though, that you've come out the other side. And you're a fighter, man. You've always been. Yeah. That's who you are, you know? Yeah, I mean, I should have been dead a long time ago. <laughs> I say that so, myself pretty regularly, and I'm yeah. super grateful that we're here. Yeah. You know, but that yeah. but that's great. And so when it came to the new album, you were already starting like pre-production when, when you got diagnosed, right? Was we were halfway done. Wow. Yeah, we were literally in the studio laying down bass tracks when I got the call and I just had to shut it down. I mean, I, I didn't even, I got the call and I got in my car and left. I didn't yeah. even, I didn't want to, I wanted them to finish the day. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, yeah. That's an emotional, it's so much emotional, you know, things, Some to take that in and to have to process that at that period yeah. of time. But, yeah. but, you know, the good news is it's great on the upside that you're going to go out with your old friends, you know, in bad religion. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we tried it in Australia, and it was, like, tremendously um, successful. And we've only done co-headlining once before. That was with Vlogging Molly, which was also a lot of fun. You know, two good camps coming together, playing, you know, sheds. Yeah. You know, playing in front of more people every night and getting new fans along the way. And uh, so it's a it's a great experience. And, yeah, we're looking forward to it. I think it's going to be great. How many dates are there? About 40 or, or do you know how many it uh, is? Something like that, so yeah. Nine weeks, yeah, nine yeah. weeks, which, which will be great. Yeah. We're looking forward to it. And uh, and there's also, of course, the new album, which which you started on. Have, uh, yeah. So... so we we'll go that? back in like January, February, finish the guitar parts and keyboards and all the music stuff. I wanted to wait at least to one tour behind me to get the voice strong and to do the vocals. Yeah. So we'll, we'll probably cut the vocals in June or July. Yeah, so maybe yeah. for for before uh, 2024, end of year release or beginning of 2025. Yeah. 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 As that, you know... You always write from the heart. You write from personal experience. Tell me, is going through this recently, has that made you write new lyrics or, or rethink some of the songs that were on this record? Well, it's definitely made some of the ones I've already written, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, 
you know, I, I mean, I'm a lot. Of, I write about hard times sometimes, and and uh, you know, uh, certain songs now have a, a completely new meaning to me, and um, and uh, uh, but the material on on this album, uh, a lot of it, it's very reflective prior to this, you know, kind of going back to. Um, sometimes as far back as when I was starting the band, you know, yeah. and what it was like, you know, when yeah. 99% of society was telling you, you can't do this. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but my personality is if you tell me I can't do something, yeah, I'm not only am I going to do it, but I'm going to, you know, be successful at it. Yeah, and try and kick ass doing it. I love, you know, when I look back to, uh, you were born in Lynn, Massachusetts, right? Which is, uh, but then, you know, moved to Southern California. And you always, you loved rock and roll like I did and just listened in, as a sponge to everything, whether it's, sure. you know, Beatles, Stones, yeah. Creedence. I mean, a, li- yeah, yeah. a list of people that you listen to. And of course, discovering and falling in love with punk rock, mm-hmm. just like I did, because mm-hmm. uh, it was something that, you know, it was being done by people that were close to our age or our age, and uh, it was it was new and fresh and, and expressed the feelings that we were having at that time. Um, so back when you when you look back on that in '78, when and then of course when you ended up releasing the first mm-hmm. single on Posh mm-hmm. Boy, right? Mm-hmm. You guys, is uh, do you remember the feeling of going in the studio that first time to make that single? Yeah, of course. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, I mean. He kept telling me to quit trying to sing like Joe Strummer, for one. Yeah. And then I had like a bunch of change in my pocket. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm bouncing around singing, and it's like the mic's picking it up, you know. I was, I was green. Yeah. I was green. But, uh, but yeah, you know, um, uh, those early days, it's, it's fun to go back and reflect on that. Yeah. You know, and a lot of the spirit of this record is, is is kind of touching on that. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited to hear that, and uh, can't wait to hear these new songs. The 40th anniversary of Mommy's Little Monster, a record that mm-hmm. you know is just become a blueprint for so many other bands and and music lovers and punk lovers. That record, you know, I remember the first time I saw it in the store. And picked it up. Like mm-hmm. I still have a vision of, of remembering that and falling in love with that record. It's amazing because it clocks in about twenty seven minutes. You know, it's like nine songs. And tell me about that because as we go back and we look at, at the forty years, you guys ended up doing that in one session, right? Because you were just trying to save money. Tell tell me what. Well, yeah, well, I mean, it was from from what I remember because I I remember we had all our friends there. It was like a party, so I was wasted the whole time. Yeah, you know. But um, um, it was interesting remastering it because it was like I wasn't paying attention to those kind of details back then, you know. And so when I was remastering it, I needed a little bit of mid-range added, you know, to get those guitars to ring out a little bit more. Um, but uh. It's really interesting. I don't listen to my own music very often. I mean, har- hardly ever. But when I do now, um, I'm not. I'm able to not be so critical and and uh, just on a songwriter's perspective, I was like, wow, you know, how did I come up with that arrangement or or that groove or that riff? It was. It's. It's not something that would come naturally to me now. It was just uh, such an interesting period. Of um, it was the beginning of trying to create something. Yeah. yeah, and it's amazing because you see, you know, uh, the creeps and telling them another state of mind. All these songs that have been covered by other artists that have inspired them. They've talked about how much the record meant to them. It was it great to actually through those years to see? All those bands that would do versions of the songs, whether it's Green Day or Face to Face, or mm-hmm. you know, what was uh, what was it like? Yeah, of course. That back, you know, yeah, it was obviously very flattering. Yeah. yeah. So uh, speaking of that, you know, another state of mind. Um, 
yeah, I think you you hit it on the head because you know I don't watch stuff that I've done really because mm-hmm. except for once in a blue moon just to make sure it's you know just to monitor yeah. if it's something recent sure. that it's all good. But generally, I'm the same way. But have you ever gone back and watched another state of mind with your youth brigade tour uh, in the past, say? I don't know, 20 years or so. I'm sure I have yeah. once, yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a tragic comedy. It's, it's great. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, I say that, you know, I kind of agree with all the other bands that I've interviewed over the years where they say, that was kind of a, that was, that they learned so much from watching what you guys went oh, through. Yeah. It was like a trial and error. You're like, you know, uh-huh. you'd like. Well, it was the epitome of doing it yourself, that's for sure. I mean, 1982, there wasn't any, major labels knocking on social distortions door <laughs> yeah. you know wanting to sign us or, or or promote us or anything so you know back then you wanted to put a record out you did it yourself yeah and you know and, and set up the tours yourself mm-hmm. and found out other people with fanzines and yeah people that were into like-minded music so mm-hmm. you'd get that promoter's name or that club and yeah and then just hope that you're uh Ram McNally, Map, or whatever else it was, would get you to the club. And yeah, we were like the French Resistance. Yeah, you know, yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's amazing, but uh, but it's it's such great stuff. You know, Mike, it was um, it was great when the self titled first album came out on Epic when you guys did the deal and put out those three amazing records mm-hmm. in a row as well with Epic, and the world embraced the band at that period of time. I mean, it was a perfect time with. Uh, alternative radio and monorock radio but those songs have become really classics uh, in people's lives things like story of my life i mean ball mm-hmm. chain you'll hear those songs all the time and um you know ring of fire your version is is truly one of my favorites i mean you know i mean other than the original mm-hmm. it's my favorite and it's been, uh-huh. you know done by eric burden and war uh, and the animals some other people but i'm like it's mm-hmm. a social d version for me you know what i mean so i know that you were going to actually record with Johnny, but he was too sick uh, on the... Yeah, it was... Um, I mean, I wanna, Johnny Cash, because you ended up working... Yeah, with I want to say it was... Um, well, I, I know I had submitted a song for the Rick Rubin stuff, but I think it was maybe too much like his older stuff, and they wanted to kind of venture away. I, I, I sent them a pretty cool rockabilly song I had written, you know, and yeah, I didn't get... I obviously didn't get the call, but um, but yeah, and then I wanted to work with June when she was sick, so I think during my solo records, so it was unfortunate. But you know, I, I got to meet Johnny Cash once. I I have, still have the guitar signed by him, and uh, yeah, and yeah, I went. It was when I was recording White Light. Yeah, and he was in the studio next door, and I went in. Uh, he was eating his dinner, watching that. That uh, religious guy with the white hair show, yeah. you know, and he, you know, I just said, "Hey, I'm I'm Mike. I'm I'm the guy that did a rock and roll version of Ring of Fire, and uh, nice to meet you. And can you sign this?" And then I got out of his hair, you know. That's amazing. Well, you know, you've got, you've got so many fans uh, that are that, like I mean, Bruce Springsteen, of course, from my home state, and uh, had come up maybe in 2008. Mm. Uh, you know, it's Pony, and then, you know, yeah, in yeah. Asbury Park, my backyard. And then, uh, you know, of course, he was out playing with you in Los Angeles 2009. Sure. Tell me yeah. about that relationship. Um, well, I really, um, I became a fan as I got to know him personally. And um, and then I went and saw his Broadway show. And uh, I was so impressed by that um, because he you know as you get older you kind of start to let down your walls you start to you know accept things about yourself and you realize it's okay to just be yourself you don't have to you know be this character that you've created or 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 and, um, and I thought his show was so vulnerable and I, I really gained a lot of respect for him after. I, I went twice. Yeah, that's yeah. great. I'm glad you Second got time I went, I think I went by myself. Yeah. Yeah. Because, there were, you know, you, it's that relationship you have with music, you know what I mean? And, sure. And storytelling that's beautiful, you know? Yeah, and just his 
his reaction to the world. You know, I mean, that's that's how all of us become musicians. Is we're reacting to our surroundings growing up, and uh, I mean, I guess we're kind of like journalists. You know, we just kind of witness stuff and and then we kind of give our version of it to the world. Yeah. When you, uh, I love those two solo albums. I remember when you first came out with Cheating at Solitaire and, you know, those two records. I want to ask you because, you know, we always, as we as we fall in love with music and we, we discover things, you know, and they become a part of, uh, of, of our arsenal and our environment and the things that we enjoy. I love that you were gave the love to and have covered Hank Williams more than once. Mm-hmm. Tell me about discovering Hank Williams and what, what you loved about him as a songwriter. Well, he's up there at the top, for sure. Number, probably number one, number two. I mean, it's him, Buck Owens, and, and George Jones are my favorite singers. Yeah. You know, just because of their, what they do with their voice. Um, but, uh, you know, it was... I don't know when the first time I heard him, but it was very similar to the first time. I do remember hearing the Carter family yeah. at a very early age, and there was just some sort of uh, desperation in their songwriting. It just sounded like they were just down and out and, yeah. and sad, and uh, I just related to that. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think that's the thing that pulls everybody in is because, it's, mm-hmm. again, you used that word before, vulnerability, and that mm-hmm. was one of the things that mm-hmm. was that was so great and is great about all that music. Um, yeah, I mean, i got to say, I'm, I can't wait for the new record. I'm, I'm very excited about it because it's been, it's been a while since there's... Yeah, it it's 2011, re- right? So. And it has a real uh, 70s, um, you know, first wave of punk feel to it. Yeah. Just a swing and swagger and attitude and, uh, you know, a um, little bit of ACDC feel, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah, it's just been a fun record to write. and I mean, it was tough to pick the... Um, I had almost 50 songs written, you know, over the last 11 years. Yeah. And, um, but once I kind of got the... The feel I wanted, it was easy to narrow it down. Yeah, that's great. I love that. I mean, you know, growing up around this, you and I being like almost the same age or close to the same age, uh, we, I'm sure, discovered the same records growing up. And, of course, sure. the, that first wave of punk, ACDC with Bon Scott originally, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And going, Sure. Because I remember uh, Greg Hetson from Bad Religion and Circle Jerks telling me, he goes, yeah, they used to put ACDC in the punk section because they didn't know what to do with them. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure. <laughs> Which I thought was a... It was funny, but it was uh, we loved those records. I mean, it was we were, we were just sponges and fans of rock and roll. And, yeah, and the punk thing. What are some of those favorite albums for you, Mike? What, what are what are some of those seminal records? When you look back at your life, what, what were the the things as you, as you went through certain stages? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, obviously, the first time I heard the Pistols album was like, um, I mean, they sounded exactly how I felt inside. Yeah, you know, as a seventeen-year-old, you know, kid who'd grown up in an alcoholic family, so um, misfit in school, and yeah. you know, so. Um, but you know, that first wave was just still had so much um, traditional influence with it, even though they were trying to be. I mean, the Pistols album is laced with Chuck Berry. Yes. The Ramones are laced with 60s girl group, you know. Yeah. But they're just loud and hard. And, um, you know, Generation X. Yeah. Um, what a great first album that was, too. I mean, I look very That was but I loved huge it. with me. Yeah. Because it was, you know, I guess it would, if they were going to have to put a label on it, it was pop punk. Yeah. But it certainly wasn't commercial. You know, it was... Not at all, right? But it was... what? A, what but a, super catchy songs, great guitar work, great vocal melodies, just great songwriting. Yeah. And... Um, yeah, Tony, James, and, and Billy, man, they, like, they nailed that stuff on those And songs. The Clash, I mean, you know, I remember 
seeing them in, I think, 1980 down in San Diego. And, you know, there was kind of back then there was like a stigma. It was like if you were punk, you weren't supposed to become successful. Yeah. And I was like, bullshit. <laughs> yeah. You know, I looked at the Clash and they had roadies, they had lights, they had good sound, and they put on a good show. And they were professional. And it's like, that's what I want to be like. I want to be like them. Yeah. You Understandably, know? and that's a cool thing. It was like, yeah, there was always that kind of, that, that attitude. But though, they were, those records hold up, they're great. I saw them in 79 yeah. more than once. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I and I've always loved them. One of my favorite bands of all time, certainly. So, But you've got, like I said, you've gotten to work with a lot of your heroes, which is great, too. Or, or they've learned to appreciate the band. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and, uh, you, may, you know, we mentioned... Uh, you know, alcoholism in our past, and, and you and I are both in recovery, which I think is great. And you've been very open about it. That's the only reason we talk about it, I didn't, mm-hmm. you know. But um, I'm so grateful for that, you know what I mean? I'm, oh, man. <laughs> well, I don't think either of us would be right here right now. Yeah, that's, you know, that's for, for sure. sure. No, absolutely yeah, I mean, not. That, that much we know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, my worst fear was just being a small little paragraph in a tiny little fanzine. And died in a motel room, you know. And, yeah. And uh, um, I didn't want to go out like that. No, no. And, uh, you know, I uh, I think because of my childhood hitting bottom, uh, I didn't want to spend my adulthood living a painful life as well. So it kind of helped me hit bottom a little sooner. I got sober when I was 23. Yeah, which is amazing. You know, and... And then I, I got this, I don't know where I got it, but I got a work ethic with the band and, you know, it became this like, we're going to rehearse, we're going to we're gonna stay here until it sounds good. <laughs> yeah, which you've done, yeah. and that's great, and that's why the live shows mm-hmm. have always been so great as well. Well, that's where we take our pride, it's our live show, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I'm just, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy... Uh, that you're on the mend and that you're working at it. And I, I, I feel really, I feel great about the fact that I know that, you know, you'll put everything in, in your power into the, the, the state of recovery. And, and, you know, the fact that you came here makes me makes me so happy, Mike. Again, yeah, well, it feels good to just be working, even if it's this, yeah. you know, just being, because uh, for so, you know, it's almost been, an, April would have been a year that i just been, uh, either feeling shitty or going through treatment or or in in pain of some sort so um uh now it's time to um you know i do a morning i've been really trying to do this meditation you know 30 minute meditation where i just you know turn off the head and get into the breathing and just get into a positive, you know, uh, imagining the future and, and then, but also being grateful for what I have. Yeah. Even though I'm in the midst of rehab right now, you know, getting everything strong again. Uh, I've got my five senses. Yeah. I'm not missing any limbs. And uh, I've got my family, I've got my friends. And I've got a promising career to go back to. Absolutely. So gratitude is a huge part of it. Yeah, gratitude is everything. I mean, that's, uh, mm-hmm. that's what I remember every morning when I get up. I'm like, I'm, I'm grateful. Mm-hmm. I'm still here. It's I'm a like, great, uh, man, if, if everyone could adapt that, I think there would be a lot less road rage and a lot less uh, things going on in this world. I absolutely yeah. agree with that. You know, one of the things that I kind of learned and followed in your footsteps was I always found it really fascinating that you love to collect antiques and you love the mm-hmm. cool things, you know, and also great old cars and stuff, you know, mm-hmm. that's, uh, and um, I, I always think of you, like whenever I'm out, I'm like, I see something like mm-hmm. a, an old turntable from, I bought this old turntable from 1956 right. with four legs of uh, sure. RCA or the phonic that came out. Literally, it was released the same time Elvis released his first RCA single. Sure. And I was like, Mike would. Lo- I, I was. Th- I think yeah. I thought about you immediately. You know, you always yeah. come to mind, which is turn great. on those let those tubes warm up. Yeah, yeah. they yeah. sound great. Yeah. And just looking at the forty five spinning too, and mm-hmm. you know, it's just, uh, yeah. yeah, that's the thing that. I love. Yeah, 
Yeah, I'm trying. I mean, I still collect a little bit, but it's it, um, by myself now. Maybe getting rid of cer certain stuff that I've got too much of, because until you have to move it, yeah, you you don't realize how much you have, and it's like I, I don't want to be a hoarder. Yeah, you know, I, you know, I did the same kind of purge five trips back to New Jersey mm. to go through storage units. Oh yeah, you know what I mean. I'll do it to you. <laughs> it's time to move. You're just like, what the hell? Yeah, I'm like, do I you need know? this? I don't know. Yeah. This I love. This I care about. You but know? you know, I I consider myself a custodian of like old things. So it's like, it's not like, it's not like an IKEA thing where it's just like. I just throw it in a fucking dumpster. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not moving it. It's going to break. You try to move it. Yeah. It's good stuff. Yeah. And it still works or it's still cool. Yeah. And so it's not like you can just toss it and, you know. So, yeah, maybe it's a gift gift for someone or. Yeah. That's yeah. what I did. It was, I gave yeah. a lot of stuff away. Some mm -hmm. of the stuff I, uh, I took. Uh, to a store, but I just literally, uh, I, I totally agree. I think we get to a certain age, we're like, that's what we got to do this. I got to uh, take this time. It's taking up a lot of space. I'll simplify things a little bit here, which is great, right? Mike, listen, I want to just, you know, say we are so excited that you came in and love having you here, man. It's, uh, yeah, well, uh, this is the only interview I've done about the reissue of Mommy's Little Monster, and you were my first pick. My only pick. Yeah. And uh, it was just, uh, we we go so far back, and uh, we're both still doing it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I'm and grateful. I want to keep that relationship going. So yeah, I'm very you. grateful for our friendship and for all and the And I want one of those shirts. Oh, I'll get you one. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, what cool. size? What size you are you uh, wearing? You're a medium. trying to get down to a medium. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I lost a lot of weight from yeah. the surgery, and I, I, I like being... Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna a, get you one, and I'm gonna send it to you. All right, Larry, we're gonna do that. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna order it for you tonight. I, I know awesome. you get it. Appreciate it, Mike. Man. I love having you here. You know, I just want to say it's so good to see you out and about. We're excited about the new album, the new tour with Bad Religion that's gonna be happening, and uh, this great reissue of Mommy's Little Monster with the sound. You know, just yeah. uh, where it needs to be. Uh, no, we we did everything. We mastered it right. We pressed it on vinyl the right way. You know, uh, I, I was really uh, just not a fan of that um, in the 90s and early 2000s when people were mastering mastering vinyl the same uh, way they were doing it on CD, and it was yeah. came out sounding really tinny, right? And cheap, weird. and it's not the way it's supposed to be. Yeah, it's kind and of we the did this right. Yeah, and I love that you did that because a perfect example is like. London Calling, right? If you get mm -hmm. the old copies of that mm -hmm. that were on Epic or CBS in the UK, they have they have that, that depth that, that and then you'll so here a reissue and it's like they took yeah. that off the CD. Oh, where you, it's like where's the yeah. bottom all end? All the warmth, like, all the warmth and body, yeah, yeah. is missing. Yeah, and yeah. that's the thing that made you fall in love with music and feel it in the sure. first place, you know, yeah. which is great. So, Mike, thanks again for doing Thank this, you. man. For Much my, love my to pleasure. you and respect, yeah. you know. Great to have Me you too. here. Mike Ness of Social Distortion, 40th anniversary, Mommy's Little Monster. Make sure you go grab that. Now on vinyl, the new album's coming soon, and tickets are available for the tour that's coming up next year with Bad Religion. I'm Matt Pinfield. Thanks so much for joining us here on KLOS.